All right, come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. The psalmist said, it, it was good when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's still good, amen? We're in this series called First John, and if you're new to Discovery, whether new to this Discovery with this series, you just started coming during the series, or it's your first time today, uh, I like to use a lot of a variety of teaching methods to, to teach the Word of God. The, the, there's topical studies I do, character studies. This one is a book study. We're taking it verse by verse. The book of 1 John, small book, five chapters in your New Testament, but it's, it's a powerful book written by the apostle, one of the 12 disciples, John, later on in his life. And, and, and if you miss any of these messages, they're all online, they're on our website and stuff, but we've talked about, and John has showed us, a few things. He's, we, we talked about walking in the light, and he contrasted light versus darkness. Last week, we talked about walking in truth, and, and he talk, we talked about truth versus falsehood and deception. Today, the title is Walk in Love. Somebody say love. love. Yeah, we use that, that word very loosely, don't we? I think it's very casually. It could mean a variety of things, depending on the context that you're using it, um, but John is going to help describe what love really is. When we say walk in love and how God has called us to walk in love, what is that love? We're going to define it clearly. John's going to define it clearly for us today. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 is where we're going to pick up, you guys. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. You should love one another. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Okay, as we go further into this letter, now we're in 1 John chapter 3, towards the middle of it, you see a recurring theme all throughout John's letter is love, but, but he's not being repetitious when he's talking about love. Every time he brings up love, he's bringing a different angle, a different perspective about it. When he originally talked about love, he, he, he said you were to walk in the light. That was, that was light versus darkness was a measure of love. In chapter 2, he said we're to love one another because we're born of God. And in and, and this chapter, in chapter 3, he's going to go even deeper about what real love is. He probes deeper into it. That loving our brothers and our sisters in Christ, he says, is not just a matter of light and darkness. It's a matter of life and death. Here's why. First John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. He says, dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8, but whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. In this section of, of John's teaching here in his letter, it's, it's like the central piece. It, it's so important to his entire letter. He's going to give us four levels of relationship that we, could, that we can, so to speak, relationship that we can operate on or, or, or live by. These four different levels. This is another test of what true saving faith looks like. The first three levels are, are what John says, that's walking in death. That is not the life God has called you to. That is not to walk in love. It's the fourth level of relationship that authenticates our faith that we are to walk in, these four levels. First John chapter four, verse one says this, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God because there are many false prophets that have gone out to the world. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to test the Spirit today to see if what we are operating by is truly the Spirit of God or the Spirit of this world. Is it the Spirit of death or the Spirit of life? Okay, four levels. Let's do it. The first level, simply put, is murder. Murder, yeah. It's the lowest level that you can operate in relation. How many murders do we have in here? Anyone, anyone? See, if I, I've tried, I'm trying to catch someone slipping every, every service, and I, ha ha, we got like 54, 54 officers in this church, so I think we're pretty safe, you guys, we're pretty safe here, but murder, of course, is the lowest level that you can live in relationship to, like, someone else, and John gives us the example of Cain in this section, verse 12, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother, and why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain is an example here of, of hatred. His story is found in Genesis chapter 4. It's the first book of the Bible where Cain and Abel, two brothers, they 
brought sacrifices to God. Now check this out. Cain here in the scripture is not presented as some atheist. He's presented, listen, he's presented as a worshiper. Meaning this, here's the point uh, that John is making. Children of the devil can masquerade as children of the light. They can attend religious gatherings just like Cain did. They can bring offerings, but these actions themselves don't don't prove, they're not proof that we're born of God. The test, the real test, John is saying, is that we love the spiritual family, and that's where Cain failed, okay? Because everyone has a spiritual lineage and a physical lineage. Cain's spiritual father was the devil. Now, that doesn't mean that Satan literally, like, fathered Cain. It means that the attitude that Cain had originated in the spiritual realm of darkness where Satan is scheming evil and deception. Cain murdered his brother and then lied about it. God comes to him, remember, and says, where's your brother? And he says, I know not. Okay, This level, murder, is the level on which Satan operates himself. That's where he exists, is on this level. Look what Jesus says about Satan in John chapter 8. It says, Jesus said to them, now the them in this section is actually religious leaders. He's talking to religious people right here. He says this, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I've come from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language so hard for you? Why is it not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. See, it's the house you belong to determines what you hear. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. There's two things that this, this, the devil desires. Look what, first, he was a murderer from the beginning. And second, he doesn't hold on to the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus is the one that actually revealed that Satan is the prince of this world. And he controls this world through these two things, murder and deception. Okay, so John again is making a contrast here. He's saying Satan is murder and deception, but God is love and truth. And your spiritual father, listen to me, your spiritual father is determined by who you're listening to. Your your spiritual house determines what you're hearing. And at this point, a lot of you are going, well, I never murdered nobody. All right, let's go to level two. Okay, write this down. The second level relationship, John says, is hatred. This is another word that we can use loosely, isn't it? Man, I hate that. Man, I, I hate him. I hate them. Yeah, we can use this word very loosely. Look what John says in verse 13. Don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates. Of course, they, they live in that. That's the prince of darkness, man. Of course, the world, don't be surprised when the world hates or even hates you. We know that we pass from death to life. Remember, this is a matter of life and death, not just light and darkness. We know that we pass from light from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Verse 15, look what he says. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a what? Is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Here's what John is saying. To hate your brother or sister is to murder him in our hearts. Now, you might not carry out the action of that heart disposition, whether it's because you're afraid of them or you're afraid of the punishment you're going to death, you're, you're going to get. But we wish death on them. Sometimes we wish the death of someone's marriage, the death of someone's calling, the death of someone's career, the death of someone's dream. Sometimes even by ignoring another person, we're treating them as if they were dead. See, murder can either be passive or active. There was this guy who was at this at the zoo chatting with the the lion keeper about the lion's den. He was like, oh, look at how cute these lions are. I got cats, and look at this. They're doing the same things, how they play with each other, and it's a shame we got to keep them behind these bars. And the innkeeper said, no, you don't understand. They might have the same mannerisms as your, ca- as your cat, but these cats have murder in their hearts. You better be thankful that there are bars around them. Here's, I think, what we need to understand. I think the only reason why some of us have never actually murdered somebody is the bars we have around us. It's the, the, the fear of arrest, of shame, of the penalties of law, of the possibility of death. We will all be judged by the law of love. 
And, and the question isn't so much, what did you do? The question is, what did you want to do? Like, if you had complete liberty to do as you please, what would you have done? That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But Jesus says, I, I, I need to get to the root of this, though. Not just the action, the root of it. I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will actually be subject to that judgment. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, look what he says. Leave your gift. Like, s- stop pretending to worship me when you got that offense and bitterness and stuff stored up in your heart. Look, I would rather, God is saying, I would rather you stop, pr- stop the whole praise charade, put it down, go be reconciled with your brother. He says, leave it there at the altar and first. Someone say first. First, 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 before I continue this whole walk with Jesus and my own relationship with Jesus. And my own, first, go be reconciled. And then God's come on back. Now we're ready to have an authentic relationship. Then you can come on back. Now, now Jesus and John, they're not saying that hate in your heart is the same thing, does the same damage as murder, nor is it the same kind of degree of guilt than actual murder. That's not what they're saying. I'm pretty sure that your neighbor would actually prefer you to continue to hate them than to kill them. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference here, right? But in God's kingdom, hatred is the moral equivalent to murder. The fact that you've never actually murdered someone shouldn't make you proud or complacent. The apostle John and Jesus are going further and they're asking, yeah, but have you ever harbored hatred in your heart? Listen, child of God, you need to have discernment to test the spirits to see what spirit are we operating from. Is it life or death? Why is it so easy to harbor hatred in our heart? It happens so it happens just by opening the door a little bit. And I want to show, I, I want to show you the three doors of deception, I'm calling them. That, that kind of we just, we just crack it open a little bit and it's a slippery slope. Three doors that the enemy will come in and deceive you. Here it is. The first, the first door is this. The spirit of offense and unforgiveness. We allow that door to be open. And to harbor offense and unforgiveness in our hearts. Every time you refuse to forgive or you fail to overlook the weaknesses of your brother or your sister, your heart not only hardens towards them, listen to me, it hardens towards God as well. You can't allow a negative opinion about somebody else to crystallize in your mind. Every time you do, your heart gets that much colder and colder toward God. You may still think you're open to God, but God's word and his voice is not able to get through the hardness of your heart. Amen, Pastor Jason. I will amen myself if you don't listen to me. This is good stuff, man. I'm just saying. The second door is pride, the spirit of pride and insecurity. Those two things, they seem like opposites, but they often go together. You know, some, some of you know, the most prideful people are filled with the most insecurity. It's that pretty girl who thanks God that she's not ugly, but uh, on the other hand, constantly looking for some guy to affirm her. It's that bodybuilder who posts pics of himself in a man thong, (laughs) but can't stop working out for fear that somebody will tell them they don't look ripped. It's the blogger who thinks they have something to say, but then freaks out when there's not a lot of comments on their post. It's the person whose marriage is straight awful, but they will do not because of their pride and insecurity. They don't want to seek out help because then people will really know I don't have it all together. It's the guy that takes pride at having all the answers but can't handle being wrong. It's the person that is great at everything they do but won't try new things for fear of failure. You, you see, the, the, the answer to this, this spirit of pride and insecurity is humility. That's the answer. It's it's the attitude of Christ. See, when I'm humble, I don't think I'm too good to do anything or too bad. When I'm humble, I can take a compliment and not let it go to my head. When I'm humble, I can take criticism and not let it damage my self-worth. And the only way you grow in humility is to love others the way that God has loved us. 
It's a spirit of pride and insecurity that we've opened the door to. It's the churchgoer who constantly acts like they've arrived and they're blind and judging others. You know, being judgmental is one of the biggest signs that you have insecurity and pride working together. And that leads to this third door. The third door is this, the spirit of religion and old wineskin can can just open the door for the enemy to get in. The spirit of religion that is that judgmental, that legalistic, that poking at and looking at, that old wineskin you're holding on to the last 10 years or what God used to do and not let him do a new thing in you. That's just an open door. And maybe, maybe you haven't, you've opened those doors, but you're not yet at hatred. If you've opened those doors, you're probably at this next level though. And that's cold love. Write that down. Cold love. Love. Write down maybe next to it, indifference. It's, it's, just, it's just indifferent and cold love. See, the best test of love isn't just not doing evil, right? It's because love requires us to do good. First John chapter 3, verse 16. A lot of us know John 3, 16, but First John 3, 16 is just as important. In John, see, the demonstration of God's love is John 3, 16, but the explanation of God's love is in 1 John 3.16. It's a beautiful contrast. In John 3.16, it says God gave his son for us. In 1 John 3.16, it says we ought to give our lives to others. Look what it says. This is how we know what love is. Do you know what love is? You know what love is? Here's what he says. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's the love of God. So how do you define love? What is love? It's important that we define love accurately. And honestly, in order to accurately define love, we got to go back to the original word love in your, in your Bible. Your New Testament was written in Greek. There was four different Greek words that they used for love. If you, someone could tell you they love you, but they're actually, they're actually using a whole different kind of love. And if you misinterpret that, you can get real hurt. If they mean a different love and not the love that you thought they were, they were meaning, Right? There's four different types of love. Not in your notes, but let me give them to you. It, it, whenever you see love in the Bible, it could be one of these four loves. The first one is eros, where we get erotic. It's erotic love. It's sexual love, eros. That's the first level of love. The second is storge. Storge, that's the family love. It's the love that we have in family members in general. The third love is philia. It's the brotherly affection, brotherly kindness love. It's where we get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Philia love is the highest love that we are able to express apart from the help of God, okay? Without the help of God and the intervention and presence of God, we cannot actually do this, this, this other love that actually John is using. The word he's using here is agape, agape love. It's a love that loves without changing. It's a self-giving love that, that gives without demanding or expecting any repayment. It, it, it is a love that is so great that it can love what is seemingly unlovable. It can still love even when it's rejected. Agape does not love in order to receive anything in return. You see, many people confuse the four loves and they end up getting hurt as a result because someone can say, I love you, but they mean a different whole kind of love. A man can tell a woman, I love you, but the love might be a selfish love. Sure, there were strong feelings in the heart, but they wanted something from that person. So you can say to a girl, I love you. But what you really mean is something like this, I want something. No, no, I don't want you. I want something from you. I actually don't want to wait either. I'd like it as soon as possible. That's not love. That's the opposite of love, okay? Love does, it wants to give. It seeks to make the other one happy, not oneself. Let's look back to this verse. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Check this out. Listen, self-preservation, it's the first law of the physical life. But this is what John is saying. Self-sacrifice is the first law of the spiritual life. And then he gives us an example, of just one example of self-sacrifice. He goes, now, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them... How can the love of God be in that person? Because it's just a lot easier to talk about showing love to brothers and sisters and to people rather than loving that person, right? It's a lot easier. 
And, and Christians are famous for this, by the way. We believe and talk one way, but practically don't live it out in our daily one-on-one -on -one relationships. They want to talk about keeping Christ in their Christmas, but they need to focus on keeping Christ in their Christian. Woo, that was good, Pastor. It's just talk. It's just cold. It's just, it's just right, wrong, this, that, this is good, bad. It's just cold, man. Now, don't get me wrong. I'll keep Christ, I want to keep Christ in Christmas. But if that's all you do and there ain't no love, it's cold. It's cold. It's dead. It's death. It's not coming from life. I don't care if you put Christ in your Christian. If they know Christ in your Christian, it's dead. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he actually is the one who coined this, this cold love phrase this indifference he said at that time he's talking about the latter days the end times that we've been studying in this first john letter at that time many will turn away from their faith and will betray the word there is to break commitment to betray let me be clear there is no such thing of love without commitment the measure of your love is found in the depth of your commitment to another person you may have heard or maybe you've even said to someone well i've I've loved once, but I've been hurt. I loved before, but I've been hurt. Or maybe you said, man, I've served before at that other church, but man, I was hurt. They, they, they used me. When someone withdraws commitment to a relationship, they are withdrawing love. And check this out. Listen to me. It's not your commitment that's growing cold when you do that. It's your heart. You can sing the songs. You can go through the motions, but something shifted in your heart when your commitment shifted. Your love started to grow cold, and you played into the enemy's hand. At that time, Jesus continues, they'll turn away from the faith, will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. This is what John is talking about here. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow what? It's gonna grow. So is your, is your love growing hotter and brighter, and softer, more daring, more visible? Or is your love growing more calculating, more critical, less vulnerable, less available? This is important because your Christianity is only as real as your love. See, here's, here's what, a, a measurable decrease in your love, it's an indicator that a stronghold of cold love is developing in your life. It's a stronghold. It's an attack of the enemy and a lie of the enemy, and I'll show it to you. This is what Paul was talking about in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be not lovers of others, not lovers of God, lovers of themselves and lovers of money, stuff, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure. Do you see this? Not lovers of, rather than lovers of God, it's loving everything else but God and others, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And the power here, yes, is definitely breakthrough in the miraculous that God can do, but in the context of what Paul's telling Timothy, it's actually the power that he's talking about is the power to live a sanctified life. It's the power to live different, to walk different. Murder, hatred, cold love, indifference, all of these, John's telling us it's death. It's walking in death. This fourth level is what he's calling us to, the test of our faith. And that is, write it down, real love. Real, it's real. It's not, it's not fake love. It's not, it's not a love that, that it looks like the world. It's real love. He says in verse 18, Dear, dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let's not merely love each other with our words, some of your translations say, but let us show the truth by our actions, right? Because again, it can be, you can be enthusiastic about helping humanity with a capital H, but it's hard to love the individual man, the individual woman, especially those who are uninteresting or exasperating or even depraved. See, loving everybody in general, in general may be your excuse to loving nobody in particular. I hope this is sitting in it because you not you, you were thinking, you're thinking with me. Are you with me, church? Come on, are you receiving this? 
But does this, does this cost, what does it cost for a, a follower, a true follower of Jesus to walk in this? Is it, does it cost a lot? Absolutely. You know what it costs? It costs Jesus his life. That's what it costs. That's the cost of real love. It's not in your notes, but check this out. Real love, this is what it is. It's serving others by dying and giving. That's the example of Christ, that he came to serve. He came to die. That's what real love looks like. That's the love that we are to walk in. There's, amen. We are, a lot of you are familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, right? It's used in a lot of weddings. Maybe you've heard it in a wedding or two. A lot of people think it's like it's for that, for the husband and wife relationship, but it's actually not. It's a good example. Don't get me wrong. It's a good example to speak into the love of a husband and wife, but it actually is, was written about the love that John is talking about here, the love between brothers and sisters in Christ, the spiritual family is what that is written to. So I want to read it to you with the context of not marriage in mind. Sure, you can apply it for sure, for sure. But apply it also to your brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm gonna, and I didn't put it in your notes because I just want you kind of to receive this. I'm going to read it to you from the message paraphrase. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but a creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all mysteries and making everything plain as day, and I have a faith that can say to this mountain, jump, and it actually jumps, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't have love, I've got nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe, or what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others. It, all, it, it isn't me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, Always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. This is the love that God has called us to walk in. A powerful love that cannot even be attained by yourself apart from God. This is an impossible love that God has called us to walk in. But when you walk in this love, when you know this love, when you're able to walk in it, John explains three amazing blessings and benefits that are afforded to the disciple who actually walks in love. Let me give you the three blessings and benefits if you're going to walk in love today. Number one is that you would receive God's assurance. You'd receive his assurance. Here's why that's important, man. Let me show it to you in verse 19. It says, our actions will show that we belong to the truth. So we will be confident when we stand before God, even if we feel guilty, some of your translations say, even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our feelings. I want to say that again. God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Sometimes our hearts condemn us. Does anyone ever have that where your heart will, will just start to condemn you and you feel the accusation of your own conscience. Jeremiah 17 says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, that no one can actually know it. But here, listen, we actually have a new heart in Christ. He's giving you a new heart and a new spirit inside of you. You don't have to listen to the old nature and the old heart. You can listen to God who is greater than our feelings. And I'm reminded of Peter who, in the moment of his like total like failure and disappointment he denied jesus three times and then he goes back to his career of fishing and jesus shows up on the beach after his resurrection and says come follow me again peter get over here and he he has a moment with him of assurance where he says peter do you love me do you love me and he restores peter because he wants him to have this assurance you got to be careful man because this the lie of the enemy the accusation of the enemy 
is seeking to rob you of this confidence that you have in Christ, to rob you of this assurance. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, in this end times, it actually says that I heard a loud voice, and this is actually John writing this about the end times, like after the end times stuff. He said, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, that's who Satan is, the accuser of the brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God day and night, has been hurled down. Now that's what happens in, like after the end times. Satan is going to be hurled down in the pit, but he's not there yet. He's still doing that thing. He's still doing the first thing, accusing day and night. I want you to see what John is doing. He's connecting this assurance versus accusation. He's connecting that. It's another contrast that John is making, but he's connecting it to our love for others. Here's what he's saying. When we're walking in love, our hearts are receptive to God, who even though the enemy is accusing us, God is greater than our feelings. And the, the assurance of God trumps the accusation of the enemy, and I can walk in the victory of his love. Though the enemy accuses us, God is greater than our feelings. But when our love grows cold toward others, it grows cold towards God. And the accusations come, and you can't, you can't hear the assurance. You can't, you can't receive the word of God because you're cold love. Listen to me to anyone today that is, that is you're, 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 you're depressed, you're anxious, you, you feel disappointment, you, you, you're, you're even questioning your worth. This is what John is saying. You are not walking. The, re, the, the enemy has lied to you. Somewhere down there is a root of a lie where love started to grow cold in your life. And, and your battle is not what you think it is. It's actually so much deeper that somewhere in your life, love started to grow cold. Because if you were walking in this supernatural love, the voice of your father would tell you who you are. He would say, you are mine. You're a princess. You are a prince of the king. And it would trump it would overshadow the, the accusation of the enemy. This is the benefit, the blessing of walking in this real love. We have this, this assurance from God, even though the accusations come at us day and night, the voice of God trumps the accusation. Here's the second benefit. This is a good one. The second benefit of walking in love is that we receive answered prayers. Anyone want answered prayers? Anyone up in here? Man, 20 of us. The rest of you suckers can do whatever you want then, man. We're going to have a good time. <laughs> Look at what it says in verse 21. Dear friends, if our hearts... Oh, look at this, man. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. See, what the enemy is after is your heart. He's after the confidence that's, that's really what's happening when he's accusing you and he's telling you lies and telling you you're not and it ain't and you are and, and you're buying into that stuff. What he's doing is he's causing your heart to lose confidence and because you don't have the confidence, you're actually, your stance with God, you're not operating from his kingdom. You're not operating from life. Listen, you're operating from death. You're listening to the wrong father. Oh, you're, you're you're here in the wrong house. And he says, we got confidence with God and receive from him everything we ask because we keep his commands and do what please him. Now, this doesn't mean that we earn answers to our prayers from God by loving, you know, the spiritual family and our brothers and sisters in, in Christ. What he's saying is your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ proves that you're in the will of God where God can answer your prayers. That's where he answers your prayers, from his will. So here's, here's the question. So, this is rhetorical. You don't, please, you don't need to answer it, but does God listen to all prayers? I mean, the common answer would just be, yeah, he's God, of course. Well, let's let the Bible tell us. Psalm 66, 18. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have what? Here's, here's the truth. God does not listen to all prayers. 
1 Peter chapter 3, Peter explained that if a husband and wife are not walking, if they're walking in enmity and offense towards each other, then their prayers are hindered. Yeah, your relationship to your spiritual family, your brothers and sisters in Christ, cannot be disconnected, disjointed from your prayer life with God. It can't. It can cause a deaf ear. Psalm 37 and 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, this isn't like, oh, man, there we go. I, I, now I know how to get what I want from God. That's not what it's saying here, okay? What it's saying is, this: when you're walking in this love, he gives you a new heart, a new spirit, and you're delighting yourself in him, and he changes you from the inside out. Your mind and your heart, the things that you even desire will change to what you're now walking in love, walking in his will, and your desires become the will of God. This is the benefit. Here, 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 that John is telling us, this is the blessing. Why this is so important that you're walk, you identify that you're testing the spirits to see if I'm walking in death or I'm walking in life, because those who walk in love and walk in life, not only do we receive answered prayers, but we we receive the assurance of God amidst the accusation of the enemy. Here's the third one, the third blessing God wants to give you, man, by walking in love, is the abiding Holy Spirit. When the scribes asked Jesus what the most important command was, remember, he gave them two commands, right? He was like, no, not one, it's two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. We're here in 1 John chapter 3, 23. We have kind of the, that command in one verse. Look what he says. And this is the command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he's commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. See, faith Faith toward God and our love for our spiritual family, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. What John is telling us here is you, those are inseparable. You cannot have this loving and faith relationship with God and yet grow cold towards your brothers and sisters in Christ and not have love for the family of God. And it's so easy to emphasize faith or correct doctrine and to minimize love. For some of you. For others of you, it's all about love and doctrine don't matter. No, no, it's all about love. No, 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 no. No, love and truth matter. Doctrine and love matters. And this is how we know that he lives in us. Look what he says. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Here's what John is saying. Check this out. To walk in the spirit is to walk in love. When I'm not walking in love, Loving others, not just love here. When I'm not walking in love toward my brothers and sisters, I'm not walking in the Spirit. I'm not listening to my my heavenly Father. I'm walking in death. I may love God. You may think you're hearing from God. But you're being deceived. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, there's the test. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. It's not like if you go to church, be filled with the Holy Spirit, memorize your Bible, go to small group, serve, give, all all those stuff. it's, it's, It's good, but void of this, remember, I'm nothing. It's bankrupt. If we love one another, that's what reveals God lives in us. And not only is he living in us, but his love is being made complete in us. This is how we know we live in him and he in us. He has given us what? His spirit. The spirit that causes us to walk in love. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Verse 16, check it out. And So we know and rely on the love God has for us. What are you relying on? God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. These three levels 
of death, murder, hatred, cold love. All a lie of the enemy that we've believed. But God is inviting us to real love. First, first by demonstrating that love to us through his son. Of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He died and he gave. And then he didn't stay there, but he imparted to us the Holy Spirit so that we could not only experience that love, but walk in real love ourselves. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.